The more we get together, 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 the more we get together, the more we change the world. David changed the world, I changed the world, you changed the world, we all changed the world. The more we get together, the more we change the world. Hello and welcome to The Future So Long with David Brin. Wow, The Future So Long with David Brin has happened already, but we press the record button too late and I just would like to set the stage for the event so that you understand what is happening, what the future so long is and also thank you for um, watching it, checking it out. At the future so long, you and I boldly create a world that works for all. That's our um, tagline. And think about it, uh, if you are able to watch this or we're there at the event, we are the one percenters of the world. We are the ones that are, um, hit the jackpot in regards to our parents, probably, or um, special genes that made us resilient and, and thriving. And that should also make us um, create a world that works for all, so everybody could thrive. And I think it's in our grasp. And uh, let's see what we can do. And here's an example. Um, Larry Lessig did amazing stuff in regards to uh, copyrights, the Creative Commons. He was the spearheading that, and now is um, his new. Uh, thing is root strikers uh, getting uh, money out of politics and last month he did a walk on to New Hampshire's uh, so New Hampshire rebellion uh, walk to the to the capital of New Hampshire because they are there the the next round of presidential election will um, start there and will happen there so um, and and so this is a great picture that there was a march and if you counted it, uh, 36 people came and marched with Larry Lessig. Uh, I hope that more people will join uh, that um, cause of getting money out of politics, which is one of the things that need to happen. Uh, another thing would be Tobin tax, so that we get rid of the high frequency uh, trading which um, David Brent touches on a little bit but not, not about the Tobin tax so um, search for that it's 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 really interesting so a big big thank you to SAP for sponsoring and we had a great event good food and a uh, good venue nice nice chairs and and also all the um, microphones and so on worked and all these people on here have helped with this Special shout out to my friend John Smart who made the connection between David Brin and the future so long and made that happen. And there's, a, there's an, another um, connection here which I will get to in a minute. So this is the agenda and the big goal is to um, make it interactive so that it's not just a lecture we are um, leaning back and consuming but leaning forward and engaging and so the um, agenda or the, the the flow of the event that I came up with was let's have David Brin share his amazing insights for 45 minutes then have 10 to 15 minutes oh wow very important a minute of silence minute of silence so that all the things that David Brin talks about can um, settle in and can resonate with you. And then we do 10, 15 minutes small group conversation about what was it that resonated and come up with one question per group or statement per group that we use the rest of the um, evening to discuss with David Brin. And then we do the book signing. And it, I f felt it worked out really nice. Please comment to um, the YouTube video or in the at the Future Salon if you were there, uh, whether that worked and whether we should do it similar next time and what we can do better. So David Brin, so John Smart organized 10 years ago the Excellent Change Conference and I helped him a bit with funding and um, 
one of the keynote speakers back then was David Brin. And I remember one thing, he talked about that, um, that, that the US is separating into the two coastal areas um, where openness and, and, and integration and, and, and tolerance and, and inclusion and then there is the big flyover of Midwest and, and South where um, often uh, that is not the case and he is advocating to reach out back then to well you have a cousin over in Kansas City or somewhere um, else uh, bring them over to and invite them and uh, show them a good time and how um, it's not scary in California and and when I was in Savannah Georgia for for a while yeah there were the people who were saying mm -hmm, I will never go to California it's all um, devil's country or something like that so um i i really like that and then uh also great new insights by what david brin talks about and he is what i really really like he is not only a science fiction author he's mostly known for that um but he's a scientist first and wrote the uh book uh uh, that is so timely now, uh, the Transparent Society, where it's looking at what can we de do um, to keep our freedom, even though there is so much surveillance, and it was seen that surveillance states coming in the late 90s, and um, well, Snowden proved everything that he was predicting, and he is saying, well, um, we need to develop surveillance, we need to develop the ability to watch the watchers and whatever um, enables that we should uh, bring forward. So without further ado, David Brin. Thank you. Is that going to be the start of some new theme? Are we going to have a new theme? If it's alternating, then it ought to be the dawning of the age of Aquarius. <laughs> age of Aquarius. Everybody! Yes. But it could just as easily be that some horrible thing happens this year that makes 9 11 look, look, look like nothing, and we decide to dive into ourselves and the enlightenment ends. Because if we don't do something about the wealth disparity problems, well, I won't get into that right now. Let's start a slideshow. Uh, and do I have a clicker? No. No clicker. Okay, you can be a clicker, so I can pace. Alright, here's a whole bunch of stuff that I have less than half an hour to get to. <laughs> Will we repeat old failure modes? Can we have the gift of foresight and look ahead well enough to anticipate problems? I'll skip the trap of specialization. Uh, scary success. Ask old John Smart, where are you, guy? Over there. You know. Some of these guys here are saying, ah, we're going to ride this wave. It's going to be great. And when I'm around them, I get to be the old part, you know, pointing out problems. But when you're not around, <laughs> I'm talking it up. OK, <laughs> let's move on to the next slide. All right, so when were better days? Almost all human civilizations, almost all human civilizations depicted any golden age as having taken place in the past. It seems to be a human reflex, partly perhaps coming from the fact that we just get grouchier as we get older. And ask my kids. Arr, arr. <laughs> golden ages were always in the past, and we fell from them. We were better, we knew more, we were closer to God, and we fell because of hubris, 
or arrogance or sin. Very few civilizations have posited a future golden age that we might make with our hands, and if not us, because we're too stupid, then at least we can be smart enough to raise kids who are better than us, and they might make the makers of a golden age. Next. The context of it all, the Fermi paradox. How many of you have heard of that? Of course you have. The Fermi paradox, what I call the 1983, the great silence, is the quandary of why we don't seem to see anybody out there. Now, of course, we may just not have spotted them yet. I was at the SETI Institute last night, right after Facebook. Why don't just juxtaposition? Um, but the notion, the notion that the calculations, next slide, that next thing, of the Drake equation, you've all heard of it, the number of stars, the fraction of those stars that are stable, the fraction of those have, that have planets, the number of planets per star that orbit in the so-called Goldilocks zone, where they might be able to have surface water. And during questions, you can ask me why surface water doesn't matter anymore. The fraction of those that develop life, the fraction of those that develop intelligence, the fraction that develop civilization, all of those are filters that are behind <coughs> us. And if any of these numbers are anomalously small, it, life may be more difficult to create. To, to spontaneously correct, create than, than, than we think. Our intelligence may be rare. That's what I think has, has some plausible explanations. I've been in this for 30 years, and I, I wrote some of the papers that try to tabulate more than 100 explanations for why we might not be able to. Some of them plausible, some of them improbable, some of them almost impossible. The question is, might the filter be in front of us? Might traps await everybody who gets smart enough to create technology? It's been a worry ever since the great arguments between Oppenheimer and Teller. On the one hand, you had a person who was an obvious genius, sage, saint of humanity, who helped make a weapon, but then campaigned like heck for us to put it under control, international controls, and lock up this technology before we used it because he claimed inevitably humans always do this. They have never turned back from the precipice of using the weapon. Versus a mad Hungarian with eyebrows the size of marmots. <laughs> who said, this time is different. Always watch out for people who say this time is different. And he said, this time is different. This will scare us out of it. This will chasten us. This will make us wake up. And there's a reason why he was right and the great sage wasn't. And any male my age, anywhere in the world, let alone America, who is alive today, owes his life to the fact that we didn't have the conventional World War III we were scheduled for in the 70s. They merely had Vietnam. And what caused this? The greatest work of art of the 20th century, created by engineers and scientists. Visual art can be defined as that which is visual, which changes people's hearts and souls without argument. And inarguably, the greatest work of art of the 20th century was, tell me, the mushroom cloud. Altered us and made us capable of being different. What was the other great work of art of the 20th century? Very good ones. At the end of the most difficult world, year any of us alive can remember, 1968. You young folks, any week of that year would have killed you. <laughs> and at the end, oh, we had music. Woo! At the end of that year, it felt as if Pandora had released everything from the box. But 
there was one News I don't know. Came from the most important Apollo mission they did on the planet. Apollo. Dual basis in space. Nowhere near enough. <laughs> but enough, maybe, to eke by the question of where they are could be lie on the left side it could be on the right we don't know let's move on but ever since the 1500s we have had crises that were precipitated by advances in technology that basically next slide that basically were laser pointer that basically were created by augmentations, extrapolations. I knew I'd get one. <laughs> Exponentiations of what we can know, what we can see, what we can pay attention to, and what we can reach. And every time this happened, Rouches said, this we cannot do. The average person is not equipped either by God or by evolution to be able to drink from the fire hose that you've created. And transcendentalists always said, this is going to change everything. We're going to be all be better and wiser. The average citizen is going to be more like a scholar. Who was always right in the short term? always the grouches. The immediate effect of the printing press was vast increases in religious strife and depredations in the European continent, the Thirty Years' War. But over time what happened was the optimists proved right. And we to this day haven't a clue how it is that human beings have been capable of being handed the next fire hose and absorbing 10 times as, in, as much information as the previous generation. There's no plausible evolutionary reason why we should be able to do what we do now, adapting to the tsunami of the internet. And we're not adapting to it evenly, are we? These are among the ironies that we face as we move along here continuously, expanding, augmenting, and exponentiating the amount that we can know, see, pay attention to. And this is part of the reason why we're saving the world, is because we can pay attention to suffering elsewhere in the world. Saving the world, that might have been a little arrogant for me to say. That's why we're sort of partially, tepidly being dragged into doing some of the things that we need to be doing. Next slide. So I, mean, I don't really have time, but it always leads to fear of self-destruction and calls for renunciation and leaving these powers to some elite. And there are elites in our civilization today that who are saying, the masses can't deal with this. And it's an old song. Next slide. And the question, are we going to repeat the errors that collapsed previous civilizations? Do not think for a moment that I am preaching cycles of history. Unadulterated bull. No, but past civilizations have made mistakes. Past civilizations have collapsed. We need to learn from them. Jared Diamond's book is extremely important, even though he reaches exactly the wrong conclusion at the end. That we must renounce, we must step back, 
This is what's preached by Margaret Atwood. This is on the left, and by Michael Crichton on the right. And it's the old story of cowardice and quailing back from our job, which is, John, go <laughs> ahead. And here it is. And will it be a good singularity or a bad singularity? There are people in this valley here who are preaching in all directions, but we have Werner Vinci down in San Diego. <laughs> so when it comes, it's going to come and meet its dad down there. <laughs> the notion that if we follow the curve of Moore's Law <clears throat> within 15, <coughs> 50 years, the number of floating point operations that we can put into a box will equal the number of 60 bit trillion synapses in the human brain. Well, according to Ray Kurzweil, it's not that many doublings away. But the interesting thing is, of course, your optimism about when the singularity is coming is inversely proportional to your age. <laughs> John here is one of those whippersnappers who says, it's going to be tough. Yeah, it's going to be hard. It's going to take at least 30, 40 years. Ray is much more of an optimist. And there goes your stereotype of the curmudgeonly older guy. But which of the six different general styles of artificial intelligence is going to come? Our Hollywood movies talk about the um, scariest, which is it emerges out of nowhere. And are in the growing computational <clears throat> systems. Skynet, Terminator, Matrix. That scares me, but not the military guys. You know what is the type of artificial intelligence research that is getting the most money right now? By far more. Goldman Sachs is putting more money into artificial intelligence research than the top 10 universities in America combined in order to do high frequency stock trading which is designed in its fundamental ethos to be totally predatory, amoral, vicious, ferocious, and parasitic. Yeah, it could happen that way. Yum. On the other hand, what if, what if, when we most mammals get one billion heartbeats. We get three and a half. Why did we become the Methuselahs of animals? There's bad news in there, and it means that it's not going to be easy for us to pluck the low hanging fruit anymore to um, live a lot longer. It's going to be tough. It's going to be science. But why? Because we had to become intelligent fast, and the way we did it was by having long. That is the way. What if artificial intelligences, in order to become smart, have to do it the way our kids do, by interfacing with the real world? And that'll mean we'll make these proto AIs, put them in little child sized bodies, and foster them to human homes. That means they'll have to spend at least 10 years with discipline. <laughs> And learning morals and learning how to at least pretend they're human. In other words, that's how we might have a soft land. If the future gods think of themselves as human beings who happen to be silicon, well, I portray that in existence. Next slide. We will skip this entirely. Next slide. Let's skip that. That's the age of amateurs. <clears throat> this is the this is the natural human social order. It's an attractor state because in 99% human societies, big guys would collude together, pick up metal implements, and take other men's women and eat. It always happened. And one result was that they were extremely conservative. They were obsessed with preventing, preventing competition both below, and this is the ultimate hypocrisy of the right. They claim to believe in market capitalism of Adam Smith, but Adam Smith knew who the enemy was for 6,000 years. And it was
those owner oligarch feudal lords. They are the ones who crushed capitalism. They are the ones who crushed markets. They are the ones who crushed freedom. And Adam Smith said so, and you liberals who consign Adam Smith to your enemies list because you've heard some rumor about what he actually wrote, try reading the first liberal. You might be surprised. <clears throat> Instead, next, this is what we made. Never perfect, but an empowered, powerful, large, middle class that makes most of the decisions and outnumbers the poor. Think about that. Almost every civilization, the purpose of all this was to improve your own karma because there was nothing you could do about poverty. Jesus said the poor will always be with us. There's nothing that can be done about it. But, well, ah. the fact of the matter is there was no assumption that you could erase poverty. This was a fact. It became a bitter lake. All of a sudden, it was somebody's fault. And so, we have the marvelous delusion that we can erase it. But the delusion resulted in the social compact that says a child should not automatically inherit her or his parent. He should not argue over how, argue over what we can afford, but the whole diamond rises. That's the ideal, and I'm not claiming it's perfect. That's the ideal. This should be our flag. Next slide. So the well off a number of the poor don't have enough. All right, all right. Um, whoever the hell this guy is. Um, Steve Mann has this is another thing I'm involved with, and that is the transparency thing, the transparent society is one of my is my nonfiction book that I don't have at the bookstore here, so you're just gonna have to make do with getting earth, perhaps, that has some of the same themes. British cover for existence. Woo! <laughs> All right, so uh, the Transparent Society has a really creepy moment on page 206, but it's all about the whole business of how can we deal with the fact that during the next 10 years we will either have Big Brother forever or never. It's really going to be decided in the next 10 years. Within the next 10 years, we will have functioning lie detectors and fMRI-based simple mind reading. And if you think that you can have a revolutionary movement against Big Brother under those circumstances, good luck. These are the fabulous tools that will make Big Brother either permanent or if we have the habit of applying the lie detectors and the fMRIs to all of the powerful, Big Brother will never arrive. One of the things I talk about is the incredible fallacy that is most prevalent today when discussing these issues, and that is whether or not you can hide. Whether or not you're going to accomplish anything by yelling at the NSA, don't look. If you think that you can blind the mighty, I would like you to show me one example from human history of it ever happening. Then I would like you to go to the zoo with a pointed stick. I would like you to climb into the baboon enclosure and poke out the eyes of the biggest baboon. Here is a clue. He won't let you. But he will reluctantly allow you to look at him. You cannot verify that someone does not know something about you. But you can verify whether or not they are doing something to you. And that has been the wellspring of our freedom. Instead of saying, don't look at me, all they'll say is, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. 
Instead, you say to the mighty, strip. That can happen, and the proof is us. And that is the basic essence of what's called surveillance, S-O-U-S, surveillance. That's the French for looking back at surveillance. And that's what Steve Mann has been engaged in, and you see it at work in existence. Next slide. 3D printing, we'll skip that. We'll skip this. It's all sorts of stuff about the failures of our phone systems and the internet with some real, real bad things that could happen to folks. Uh, we'll skip what's horrible about interfaces and... Oh, this is cool. This is a game that... Uh, we just started this, the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination down at UCSD. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, all of the departments signed on to participate in this wonderful venture to explore the science and the arts, all other aspects of human imagination, and um, give you some money. But uh, this is one of the things we're working on. Uh, how many of you have heard of Will Wright's uh, uh, game Spore? This would do it right. Uh, in other words, instead of intelligent design where you buy gills or buy a tail, you would have to earn it by choosing your star, choosing your planet, choosing your ecosystem. And it's highly educational. This would be a great museum. Uh, and then at the end, you get your own species, your own intelligent species, and you can play them in encounters at the extraterrestrial terrarium. This would be both online game and in museums. Next. So even if we don't meet aliens, we'll make our own diversity. We'll make different kinds of humans. What, what, what happens in a civilization like ours? We disperse. We go into our ho million hobbies. We find some way to be different and interesting. And this is part and parcel of the great propaganda campaign of Hollywood. That is the most intense propaganda campaign any public has ever been subjected to, especially you. What? Why? Yeah. Buy stuff. Super That's Bowl. good. Super Bowl is good. That's basically my clan. My clan. My clan. Value. Very good. Suspicion of authority. So on. You cannot name a popular film that you've enjoyed in the last 30 years in which the principal character, you go bond with the principal <coughs> character because of three things. There's a villain who expresses intolerance in some way. And that's how you know it's a villain. If it's just verbal intolerance, then the, then the SOB has a chance. If he kicks a dog, he's going to die. <laughs> Eccentricity. The principal character expresses some eccentric trait, and you bond with that character, not because she's so similar to you, but because it's, that's a cool, harmless eccentricity. And the number one of them all is suspicion of authority. Some authority figure has to be, has to be confronted. There's a fourth message. You invented suspicion of authority. All your neighbors are sheep. You see that message all through, too. I, pre I approve of the first three. But the fourth is tearing us apart. All your neighbors are sheep. None of your institutions can ever work. You invented suspicion of authority. You and a few people like you. Being more honest and completely in the direction. And there you go. <laughs> the point is, we will do all sorts of things. We'll diversify ourselves. We'll bring in AI. We'll uplift animals. Even if they're not as intelligent now as our romance makes us think they are, we'll modify them until they are members of our councils and arguing with us on Sunday morning political talk shows. I'd love to live to see that. Next slide. It all comes down to these prefrontal lobes, these nubs just above the eyes. 
These are the organs that truly make us different. These are what enable us to do what Einstein called the Gedanken experiment, the thought experiment. What will happen if I take this idea to work tomorrow? What will happen if I wear, what will people think if I wear this? What will happen if I try to run this yellow light? We're constantly doing that. And most of the time saying, eh, no. Ladies, you have no idea how many times per minute we go, no, no. Right, guys? Give us some credit, because we actually edit ourselves a lot more than you can imagine. The interesting thing is Moses was said to have had lamps on his brow. Nobody knew what that meant. If you read about him, you realize he had some degree of thought experience in an era when it might have been crude. But it was mistranslated. They looked for another word, assuming it had been mistranslated, and the closest word they could think of was formless. So for a thousand years, most depictions of Moses, and this is Michelangelo's Moses, probably his greatest work, depicted him with horns in his head. Boy. So I go east and I talk to government agencies all the time, and, and I tell them, look, you do this. You try to anticipate problems. And you ask us for lots of money and power to see in order to anticipate threats. Good, fine, go ahead, anticipate, staunch the threats. But you've got to recognize the simple fact that you will fail. And when you fail, we have to rely upon the thing that worked on 9 11, the only thing that worked on 9 11. Not one action taken by a single government professional worked on 9 11. Everything good that happened that day was performed by citizens armed with thieves. The firemen charged into the building and died. It was New Yorkers who put out the fires. And the war was over the same day because of the heroes on flight the way they needed to be. What was the war about? Every generation of Americans has to prove that they're not decadent cowards. It's happened in the entire history of the republic. Every time we've been in a fight, Hitler, Stalin, they all assume they have their decadent pleasures. They're rich. They have no guts. <coughs> and they had to be taught better. That our experiment is a positive sum game. How many of you know what that phrase means? If you don't, Look it up. It's the most important concept you can leave here with. A zero-sum game is where I win by making you lose. Chess, football. A positive-sum game is where I, ha, ha, I win. I get to be a little richer than you while my product makes us all rich. Where you, the winner has won a little more than everybody else. And we can have our decadent pleasures and still have guts. And that is what the heroes of UA are doing. One day, and all the rest of that war was not necessary because that lesson was taught. So, here we are. I have woven a number of things. I could have done it more. As a matter of fact, because I have five minutes, I'm going to add one little bit. And that is that Hollywood sometimes defies your expectations. How many of you watch the Spider-Man movies? Now, I don't consider them to be great art. <laughs> I, I, I think they're kind of uh, um, B-plus. It's an interesting little tradition they have in all the Spider-Man movies. He spends the entire movie saving New Yorkers, except in one scene when New Yorkers save And it has to be deliberate because it's in all four of the movies. 
They did it really well in this last one. You remember with the cranes? Swinging the cranes? That felt good. We don't have superpowers. But look, you're okay. We're going to have to stand up for you. And that's the kind of thing that might affect whether or not we will be heading out there. Because one of the explanations for the Fermi paradox that I think is very valid is you may have a lot of life, you may have a lot of civilization, but if 99% of human civilizations fell into a pyramidal social structure that was fundamentally antagonistic to scientific advancement and egalitarianism <coughs> and the proper maximalization of use, use of human resources of children, then why, not, why wouldn't that rule apply Darwinistically everywhere else? In which case, it may be that this renaissance of ours, this diamond shape, which had a couple of other experiments. The Athenian democracy of Pericles, for example. When it fell, the oligarchs, using propagandists like Plato, crushed it for 2,000 years, swearing they would never let it happen again. What do you think will happen if we... They will swear that they would prevent it for and by that point, through genetic engineering, the top of the pyramid will be superior. And the, the pyramidal social structure will be locked in permanently. So the question is, where is it? Does the filter await us too? There's the, there's the, there's the Drake equation. Let's have another slide. There's the galaxy. What if we're the one? We're both fated and booted out. What if everyone out there is waiting for us? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet, there's hardly a more chilling thought you could take home. I thought we just had all of human posterity to carry around. Now we have to carry you too? Fuck up. Carry it. A minute of silence. So now that's for the room for six to eight people. And uh, we have like, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes, um, let's say, till, till 8 o'clock to uh, talk about what resonated the most. And uh, we'll talk about um, what you would like to ask for a statement of the one who came. Try that. But um, I think you should do that. Don't. Sounds like fun.
I saw your book. Cool. Did you get one in the mail? Um, I didn't look today, but I. Do you have an extra one or one? Okay, well, I, if I have one, uh, I'll be, I, I should be getting one, but I'll bring it back next time I see it. So, have you formed the group?
Hey everybody, it's me, it's Greg. I think you can hear me now. Hang on, let me mute Mark. Okay, I'm back. So we have the first question or first couple of questions. So let's uh, let's make it good. I like Alice's start. Uh, let's see. How do we know that no one is talking or in a larger sense? Uh, well, yeah, okay. I mean, he didn't cover this, but remember, like, NASA is not exactly phoning home. We're just making a lot of noise, which people might detect. But I like the idea that John was bringing up where he says, uh, maybe animals are more sentient than we believe. So maybe it's a discussion of we haven't advanced enough to notice other people are out there. So, and, uh, so I invite again, do we want to um, uh, refine Alice's question anymore or do we want to start on another subject too? Because we can ask her more, more questions. So Alice, I think he was saying that we have that capacity, but are we, uh, are we cognizant of the fact that when we get to any other planet in the universe, it could be a completely different approach? And Mark is starting to hurt us. So uh, I invite, is there another question? Those of you that are on the uh, line, is there anything else that's pondering that you're thinking you wanna uh, put to the group and then thus have us ask from online to David? As I said, we get first questions, so let's make it good. Yeah, come on. Man. There we go. Come on, Jack. Let's see what you got. Okay, um, good, good point. Now the, the need for survival, John, if you take um, David Brin's pretty basic description, he's kind of basically saying, you know, in this, in this world, everybody's got, a, got electricity some of the time and they got heat some of the time and they have food, most of them have food some of the time. Okay, Jack, that one's pregnant. Um, anybody else want to uh, refine his or do we like it as is? I would even, um, I'll even uh, promote it to being the first. Don't worry, Alice, yours is good too. We'll, we'll, we'll squeeze that one as well.
interesting question, John. Um, I think he was kind of asserting that either we can or we can't. Uh, it's a matter of how successful are they and how much other people may benefit out of things like the democratization of, of, of voice and of individuality, as he was describing with mobile phones. Okay, let's wrap it up. That's the thing, John. Um, I don't know that. Does that, does that sound unhopeful? I feel powerless on this respect. I think it's a matter of which which big brother entity either benefits from the the sea of individuals versus the the massive control of, of centralization. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> so in my case, I have absolutely no idea what I would do. Go buy the next iPhone, but then that puts me under control of a platform, right? I'm talking to the online people. <laughs> Everyone's jealous that we're having such a good group now. Okay. All right. So wrapping up, we have two questions. The one from Jack and the one from Alice. And I'll ask Jack first and Alice second. Are we good with that? Anyone want to refine a question? It's your last uh, uh, last chance. Uh, Mark's going to start playing accordion music. See you all soon. You have to be the right age to know who that is. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're my age, then you remember uh, the original Weird Al, uh, Alan Sherman. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Weird Al. <laughs> you have to be the right age to know who that is. Well, you know, if you're my age, then you remember uh, the original Weird Al, uh, Alan Sherman. Uh -huh. Hello, dear. Hello, Bada. I didn't even know you came into the. Hello, Bada. <laughs> Counting both feet, I have ten toes. They're not lady toes, they're men toes. And I keep them as mementos, for I love them tender. <laughs> On my hands are many fingers, very good as doorbell ringers, and the thought of fingers lingers in my haunted memory. On my face, two eyebrows, they're not your brows, they're my brows. Behind those eyebrows, that's where you'll find me. <laughs> Believe it or not, I used to sing it too. <laughs> David, can you sing it with automation? <laughs> Alan, you want to Counting both feet, I have ten. I don't know. <laughs> Alan Sherman. Yeah. Okay, so. So we we'll start out with the online question. Right. Well, David, we actually have about uh, 15 people, give or take different blogs, uh, online listening to you, and we've been having a vibrant discussion. Um, and the first and probably the uh, hardest question we have for you is, could you summarize, and this is from um, Jack online, he says, can you summarize the conditions that lead to your assertion that in the next 10 years uh, will be the make or break of the Big Brother um, lock-in scenario? And that will be that. I have a number of pieces of evidence on that. One is the simple fact that the research apparently is really zeroing in on the lie detectors. Which means that if we do at any point in the future crest over to a pyramidal social structure where an elite gets 
obligate power, they will be able to question all potential rebels, and that will be that. Um, but there's another reason I believe it, and that is the frenzy with which some portions of our natural moneyed aristocracy American are waging culture will to pragmatically the, they don't have to be this frenetic instead about stymieing every American political institution and preventing it from I action. believe there is a frenetic the monomaniacal intensity of their efforts to and prevent the don't. natural, easygoing American to will to pragmatically negotiate with each other and to instead and investigate what I think is in the history of our history. All means it is the natural. I believe there is a frenetic we're all aspect to it, and I believe it's because they know it, that they have one last chance. And if they don't, cause a precipitate transition to oligarchy, the natural human governance system. And yes, oligarchy, pyramidal social structure, it is by all means, it is the natural human civilization. We're all descended from the harems of guys who pulled this off. Ladies, that's why we're insane. Because we all have delusions that we can have harems. Oh, I, I, I don't blame these people for behaving the way oligarchs always have throughout history. I do not hate them. But I do know that there are billionaires in America, especially, who do not buy into it, who believe in the positive sum game, who believe that they are members of a civilization that was fun because they were able to hire a whole lot of middle class engineers. And they like those engineers a lot. And they'd rather have a diamond shaped social structure. And where are, where are the biggest accumulations of those billionaires? This Valley and Hollywood. And ironically, these are the billionaires who've signed the Buffett Pledge and who are saying, raise my taxes. I'm not, you know, I've said it many things critical of the left, I've said many things critical of the right, but the answer to the question of why I think this is a critical time, and it's a good question, because you can accuse anybody at any given time of, say, a temporal chauvinism, of thinking, this time is crucial! And quite frankly, if you had asked my 40-year-old self, or my 30-year-old self, or my 20-year-old self, if he, if he was living in the crucial decade, he probably would have said yes. But the tools of potential oppression are growing close. Next question. The follow-on from the previous, which is, given what you were just saying, this is from John, John Reed online, um, what would you do tomorrow, given what you believe today about the 10 years being important? I think we need to get past the notion that we can solve the problems. We can solve the problems of the information age by hiding. We need to be militant, all right, but we need to be militant about seeing. And because that's the way we can hold the mighty accountable. That's the way you can watch the watchmen. We can only do it if we are militant, but we have to be militant about the right things. The last year featured, 2013, featured the most important civil rights uh, news in 30 years, and yet it was hardly covered by the press. Do you know what it was? The courts ruled and the Obama administration gave full support to the set, settled law that an average citizen has the right to record his or her interactions with the police. 
Think about it. You are helpless against authority as an individual. The only recourse you have is the truth. And if that is taken from you, you're screwed, and so are we. Now, was that the end of the story? Of course not. Cell phones are being accidentally smashed all over America as we speak. But at the end of 2013, we had the news on the media showing a man in shackles and an orange jumpsuit being sentenced to three years in prison for smashing the cell phone on oh. the man he was arrested. Because someone else caught it on his cell phone. And that's the point of why both the Transparent Society. Next. So you, you brought up the age of amateurism and the question of can we? You definitely think we should, but can we? Can we make a age of amateurism? Can, can we make a difference? Can we, can we make positive change? Can we do the things necessary to ensure a better future and survival? And there was an interesting juxtaposition in Silicon Valley tonight, which was that Kevin Kelly, and Mark and I were talking about this over email for him. Tonight, Kevin Kelly, who is the author of Cool Tools. I, I, subscri I was one of right. the original subscribers. Which, is, a, which yeah. is an upgrade you know, to the whole Earth catalog. Did you, was, did you get your hands on the actual book? I'm, I just ordered it. So, oh, so, it really takes you back. So, so you know, it's really interesting that tonight there was a discussion between those two folks about a new catalog of tools for do-it-yourselfers that included information Included maps, included websites, instructions. So I wanted to throw the question back at you. You know, if you believe that amateurs can and that everyday people can, what are the things that you think they should be doing? Well, first off, it comes back to the notion of the positive side again. Starting in ancient Sumeria, we began the long, slow process of what became the age of specialization. And in the farming communities, there was very little surplus. And there was frequent starvation. And it was necessary that we had a parental social structure. It was a reform. It was a good thing. Because then you'd be absolutely sure that the sons of the aristocracy would never mess a meal. And that way, some kids would reach adulthood with fully myelinated brains able to read and write. The one-tenth of one percent, that was a good thing in those days. And they could afford some specialists. Well, it took off. And the 20th century's one monotonic theme, the monotonic rise in the degree of specialization from the beginning to the end, all the things we, almost all the things we used to do for our families, we were farming out. And we paid for it by being really good at one or two things. It's not going to go any farther. In an industrial society, you have run out of doublings of the number of people who can be professionals. You can't double it anymore. It has to be matched by the age of amateurs. And this brings us to the positive sum game. How many of you have an avocation that you're really good at? You're really good at something that's not your day job. All of the great scientists I've ever known had artistic avocations that they did at an almost professional level. I'm told that at three years old, I watched Einstein play the violin at a concert. I don't remember it, but I was told. <laughs> We can be many things. I portray this in, in the way of existence. We had better be, because if that's the case, then the dispersal and increase in our skills and the number of people who are skilled in a number of things does not have to be limited by the population. All of a sudden, you, you, you I was talking about the, the, these specialization problem. Here's what it was. I was an undergraduate at Caltech, and 
uh, we would chemical abstracts would get larger every year. You, know, you have no idea what that is. <clears throat> chemical abstracts was a series of volumes that monthly came out with just the abstracts of all the chemistry papers. And it got larger every year. And it was really, really hard because they were all chipped in stone. That old. <sighs> all right. And we were all convinced that the singularity thing was coming. That we had to know more and more about less and less. Until, you know, it looked as if you followed the curve, you'd have to be 50 years old before you knew enough to be able to do any original work in anything. And you'd be so specialized that you have no idea if somebody down the hall was doing the same thing with a slightly different vocabulary. It was truly upsetting. We were all obsessed with it, and you hear nothing about it at all anymore. Why? Computer literature searches became Google. Narrows zones of specialization on the university, rigidly defined, shattered. As I said, the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, every department signed on. Cross-fertilization, who has heard of C.B. Snow? Wow! <laughs> 50 years ago, the two cultures, they can never talk to each other. Not in California. Artists are doing physics. Physicists are doing things. Occasional, occasionally astrophysicists. Did I answer your question? Look, I am accused of being this cloud cuckoo optimist. And I certainly am acting that way, aren't I? Would you like me to balance it out? Yeah. I could give you some nightmares. The problem, oh, I did mention Goldman Sachs. <coughs> the point is, I refuse to be called optimist. I know how far living beings are. I know what we're capable of, and we've been in 6,000, 10,000, 100,000 years of darkness, savagery, and viciousness. And given that, to live in California now, with more than I need to eat of really good food, my kids are all healthy. Look, I remember all my past friends. And I never got to live past 16. Because the one thing that continues in all of your lives is personality. And you, can you imagine this being allowed to live in any past culture? You're rotten, burned at the stake. For the first time, I not only get to live past 16, have kids, but I'm honored for being like this. There is nobody more loyal to this civilization. You're looking at Mr. Loyal to this civilization because I know what human civilization is naturally like. And we're an anomaly. We're weird. We are still the rebels. You know what the most computations are being done on Earth right now? I hear is Bitcoin, the most CPU cycles. That's not my question. The gum in the works that I like to throw to the eternal optimist, Mr. Smart, myself, <clears throat> having a background in neuroscience, is what if Mother Nature, so I became a scientist because I always admired Mother Nature as an engineer. It's just amazing. And I always wanted study that works. Ours for Algernon, of course, AI, that's the transformative, getting yourself smarter is the ultimate change. The ultimate scientific question, but uh, what if Mother Nature has already achieved the optimum point for human beings as it does in so many other things, like dolphins can make a sound. What if network effects make it so that even with enhanced intelligence, the best maybe you can do is double IQ. And aren't universities an attempt 
and bringing geniuses together to solve problems is because of network effects and variables and truth is not true at all? Well, you, you, you raise a, a whole bunch of important points. And quite frankly, at this point, amid America's culture war, I'd settle for a 10-point increase in our IQ. I think that that could be maybe enough for us to have a soft, very soft scenario uh, in which we just solve a lot of problems and do better enough and get smart enough to notice that we're doing a bit better year by year by year. It'd be okay. It'd be okay. We would die. <clears throat> he thinks we're all going to put our brains in the plastic. And it could happen. It could happen, as my kids say. But nevertheless, you know what I don't like about the singularitarians? Every generation of transcendentalists have said, I can offer you eternal life if you only do the right incantations. But we were able to shrug off the old transcendentalists by saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'll do the incantations. I'll be pleasantly surprised if it happens. And then when it comes to your time to shuffle off this mortal coil, at least you have the anodyne, you have the solace. Well, at least this happens to everybody. When it happens to me, I am going to say to John Smart, you promised! <laughs> This is why this old fart at least claims with his prefrontal lobes eh, it's going to be more complicated than you think. I don't know if I answered your question. But let's, ask, let's have another one. Hey, David. First of all, I was curious what house were you in, Caltech? What, what's the most boring house with the least personality? Blacker? No, Blacker has plenty of personality. <laughs> no, Raddock is a bunch of Mormons. No, it's Lloyd. Oh, Lloyd, okay. That was a very good one. See, you guys couldn't even think of it. <laughs> I, a question is, um, what, what, what you might think about building the peer-to-peer -peer economy? so that we can bring about a post-scarcity economy and abundance and head off this oligarch um, society and preserve and build out this um, you know, the diamond. Well, look, I claim to be an Adam Smithian libertarian, a Heinleinian libertarian, which means that I don't, I'm not going to waste my time screaming at all government when government can be useful in some ways to create the miracle of our four great enlightenment arenas of creativity. And these four arenas of creativity harness the greatest creative force in nature, and that is competition. Uh, this doesn't sound very sweet to a leftist, but this is the difference between leftists and liberals, and you guys have got to get used to each other, used to it that just because you're allies, that doesn't mean you're the same. Competition is a bad word to leftists, whereas to liberals, uh, is it fair competition? Is it fair? Is it open? Is it transparent? Is it flat? And that's exactly what Adam Smith called for, and that's exactly what the American founders rebelled against the enemies of flat, open, and fair competition. Do you know what the American founders did? They seized between one third and fifty percent of all the land in the country. Doesn't sound exactly unsocialistic, does it? They banned primogeniture, so you had to for two generations. It was you had to have a good reason to divide your estate among your children anything but equally. What did that have the effect of doing? Breaking up concentrations of wealth. This was a radicalism that would have FDR makes FDR looks look like look like uh, um, Andrew Carnegie. 
Okay. <laughs> Paris, 1789. Later that night, 1780. What am I referring to? Revolution. Start the revolution without me. Come on. <laughs> Later that night, 1789. I don't. I'm getting old. I used to be able to tell concepts. What was it again? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <coughs> These four arenas are markets, democracy, science, and law courts. And in all four cases, the more the disputants know and the more open and transparent it is, the better they work. And the darker it is, the worse they work. And Without a doubt, the most amazing thing is that the ultimate dream of Marxists and libertarians is the same. A world in which mostly sovereign, totally confident, and empowered individuals mostly make their own deals with each other, with a veneer of government keeping everything fair. How amazing that Marxists and libertarians have the same dream. That is, until the libertarian movement is taken over by the followers of a mad Russian woman. <laughs> <laughs> You'll like my little riff on Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I would look it up on, on my blog, in which I decrypt and show what an incredibly close acolyte of Karl Marx she was a heretic, but she only changed one thing. Otherwise, her teleology is almost identical to this. Anybody else? I like to believe in the diamond of that. Turns that it can be confused with a rising pyramid. In fact, the pyramid may already be. Well, you said it all in your first four words. What were your first four words? I like them. Uh huh. And why would you like to believe in the spirit? It worked. Because you believe in it. And how do you serve the pyramid best? By being happy go lucky? Or do you serve it best with your criticism? You see, I earlier criticized the left for being only critical, for never admitting that things work. That's different than saying it's all sugar plum fairies. No. In all four of these arenas, what is happening? You're getting competition, but what is competition at its base? What is the great tragedy of human nature? The great tragedy of human nature is that we are utterly delusional. We get caught up in our subjective reality.
church that failed years later in Katrina. Every government agency almost government agency, federal, state, or local, Democrat, or Republican. Shut up, sit down, we'll take care of this. By every year when I go back east, Of a couple of little laws that could make a that is, we equip our cell phones. Weeks later, under cell phone with dozens of outgoing texts, and people had and some of the things that I criticize have come out. All you would need if we had. Going on this time and time and looking for it, and putting explicit reference back to the Old Testament, it's like this is where you spend your time with the poor people, not the rich people. And what he was doing was building networks of resilience. You knew him personally? And as I said, I got no problem with, with the, you know, a nice Jewish boy, who, a nice rabbi who said, Good. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's the crazy man who followed him um, <coughs> fell off a horse and his head on his way to Damascus, I got real problems with him. There are a lot of crazy people like that. Yes, but this guy took over. Uh, so, you know, do you know what is the most celebrated holiday on the planet? Ah, it's by far the most celebrated holiday on the planet. I'll give you a clue. We just had Chinese New Year, but is that the only New Year that the Chinese celebrate? Everyone on Earth New Year's, secular New Year's. It is the eighth full day, including Christmas. Oh, well, all right. You're, you're off work. What happens on the eighth day after the, after the birth of a nice Jewish boy? The entire world celebrates the circumcision of a nice Jewish boy. Uh, somebody else. <laughs> Hi, David. It's Kalia. Hello, Kalia. Um, so I'm with you on the uh, sort of self-righteous indignation uh, as an addictive drug. I think both on the left and the right. Um, however, um, those who name this issue often don't present solutions, and I hang out with the folks who've been working on 
deep dialogue, deliberative democracy, things that are democratic, that have nothing to do with putting little pieces of paper in ballot boxes every four years, but having deep dialogues about critical issues and potentially having those adopted by legislators. So you know, are folks like you who have these wonderful uh, capacities to pontificate, like is deep dialogue and deliberation in your science fiction of the future? And if not, could you write somewhere? We do that and look at the National Coalition for Dialogue. Well, what, I, what I have a paper that was published by the American Bar Association's Journal of Dispute Resolution about what it would take for the internet to become a fifth competitively creative accountability. And it's called, uh, look, look it up under David Brent Disputation Arenas. And what I do is I appraise what is, what's it markets, democracy, courts, and science have in common? Basic rhythms. Because their products are so different from each other that it masks what they have in common. Markets can be chaotic, and good doesn't always have to win. Because it doesn't matter. Eventually, good products will find their way through, and we have to maximize creativity. Courts are the opposite. Courts can only afford a small error rate. Therefore, courts are prim, meticulous, rule-based, turning over every stone. Because their product is justice. And even so, they have a high error. But you cost, the price you pay, is low creativity. So you have a high error rate in markets, lots of creativity. But they share the essence that there's a centrifugal phase in which participants can find a place of safety. Their company, attorney-client privilege, their tenured labs at the, at, in, in science, political party. But then there's a centrifugal phase of a call to ritual combat that cannot be defeated. The election, the marketplace, your day in court, <coughs> the scientific conference. And this process, it, when it's kept open, is marvelous. Well, we've had 400 years to develop these. The internet has only one of those two phases. The internet has only the centrifugal. We can all separate into safe places where we can have circle jerks of people of our own kind who agree with us in little Nuremberg rallies. And in my novel Earth, I talk about how some hackers try to break into these echo chamber Nuremberg rallies, which are one of the main features of the net. When was the last time you saw anything really, really stupid? It should be the arena where instead of markets, policies, scientific theories, instead the internet should be actually destroying bad ideas. When was the last time you saw a really bad idea circulating on the internet? Die! <laughs> Good ideas. You have, you, you, you go on a blog and you type out the most devastating rebuttal that anybody since Aristotle has ever seen. And nine out of ten of the people on that comment section say, oh, you ripped him a new one. And maybe even the guy himself says, huh. And what happens with that idea? The next minute somewhere else. No, there is no ritual call to com ritual combat that cannot be refused, that actually determines the quality of product. The internet is new. Now that we know what's missing, possibly we could design something. Does it say that? Okay. Um, well, in my paper, I discuss what might be the traits of a ritualized combat system on the internet that people would attend, that they find fascinating, transfixing, and that fanatics would be shamed not to attend. 
That would be good. That would be cool. But then again, you know, I'm such a dilettante. I come up with ideas and then I don't follow them up. I have patents for entirely new ways that people can interface online. It's now seven years now. And there has been no, there not only was there no prior art, there's no art today. Nobody's huh. doing these things. I can't find a VC who would give me a time of day. No, that's not actually true. But it'll take me to lunch and talk about sci fi. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing. Yes. Yeah. She had to go over there in order to show That's right. Following up on your, um, your discussion of transparency, I'm intrigued, but I'm kind of pessimistic, and I say this as a former small town newspaper reporter, long enough ago that I didn't have to worry about numbers of clicks on my articles, my good, dutiful articles about school board candidates and planning commissions and whether the freeway, the new freeway is going to rip out this part of town or that part of town in the pros and cons, knowing that the article about the latest uh, doings of Lindsay Mohan was going to get 100 times as many clicks. You've already addressed what I think is one of the, the flaws of the marketplace of ideas, you know, just the idea that bad ideas can still circulate. How do you deal with just the issue of distractibility and people who, at the end of the day, would really rather look at cat videos than deal with global warming or no fault insurance or something? Do you remember the expansions of human vision, knowledge, and attention. And they all led to big bloody wars. Well, yeah, I mean, another example would be radio and loudspeakers, um, which led, which in, at the beginning of each of these things, they are usually taken over by master poeticists. And then in the 1930s, there were some pretty gruesomely horrible master poeticists who hypnotized whole nations. And the biggest difference in the English speaking world was that our masterful demagogue polemicists were on our side. And, and that we, maybe we deserve the credit for that because we did choose Churchill and FDR. But, look, I am a 17 year old, I have to take this plug to his computer. You know? These are new addictions. Just because we've managed to, on average, elevate ourselves after the initial trial period, elevate ourselves to a new level where we could drink from the fire hose and know more and discuss things. Does that mean that I am guaranteeing you that this series of miracles will go on? We had no idea why we crashed through the glass ceiling and held down not just dolphins and ships and whales, but in the last 10 years we've realized prairie dogs, corvids, crows, parrots, sea lions, <laughs> all of them. Here's the exciting news that ever gets all the press play. They can use tools. They have 100, 200, 300 group vocabularies. Prairie dogs will, will, will bark that it's a human, it's female, and it's wearing a wet sweater. Well, they don't know sweater. But the point is that they all seem to cluster. And we smashed through, not only enough to become masters of creation, but to contemplate that fact. And every one of these revolutions resulted in being able to drink from a bigger fire hose? No, I'm not guaranteeing you a darn thing. This may be the time that we reach our limit. I just don't know. I do know this. We've got to try. Things are working better than they ever have before. And we have what looks like Star Trek within our grasp. Not ours, but our grandkids. And I'll tell you this, my kids are better than me. My sons 
I thought I would have to teach them how to deal with bullies. And there is bullying in the schools, but we worry about it more, we fret about it more, when there's actually much, much less. You guys my age, do you remember what it was like to be 12? Your shirt, you would come up with a torn shirt and a busted lip once a month. And I'm talking middle class white. My kids, well, it didn't hurt that they had black belts, but <laughs> long before they had black belts, they come from, from school and a, a guy snarled at me and called me stupid. Is that bullying? Amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> One more. No. Oh, are we, we're we going to stop? Okay. Well, you've been lovely, and I hope I have been cantankerously weird enough for you. Thank you all for joining. Bye. Bye.